Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm a couple of minutes late. Took a little while uh, connecting and so on. Uh, are the residents online? Are you uh, able to see me, able to see the slideshow? You can indicate that either by texting me or by writing on that live chat. Uh, I'm seeing that the concurrent viewers are 9, now 11. So I, I, I guess I can start. Can you indicate to me whether I can start by writing either on the live chat or just texting my iPhone? Okay, great, thanks. All right, so um, first of all, I want to thank you all for the wonderful and altruistic work you're doing, you're, you're all doing during this pandemic. Um, on our part, we're trying to do our best to support you and all of us are trying to do things like get PPE and all for you. Uh, but I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of all the surgeons to thank each and every one of you uh, for the fantastic altruistic work you're doing for, uh, for patients and essentially your fellow human beings. Um, before I start, I want to give a big shout out to my son, who is uh, a professor. He teaches economics in Brock University. And he's the one, when I was looking for a way to live stream my presentation, when I was looking at Zoom and so on, he started teaching his students in Brock University um, through YouTube Live. And uh, I'd like to thank him, uh, Cornelius, for uh, giving me this idea of YouTube Live and, 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 and teaching me through a rapid tutorial on how to use it. Uh, thanks again. So I'll go on to what we are going to be discussing today. Um, essentially, uh, in order for you to do a safe operation, you need to know your anatomy, not just as a medical student knows it, but in a way that a surgeon would regard anatomy. And um, if you want to distinguish yourself as a surgeon, uh, you, you need to know a very detailed anatomy of the operation you're going to do. Uh, you can muddle along without that detailed uh, knowledge, but you won't be uh, doing what you would want done for yourself if you were a patient as a surgeon. So what I'm going to be talking to you today is about the surgical anatomy of splenectomy and duodenal cauterization. Now, I'm also going to go into some of the embryology of this because that, as you will see, is very basic in understanding the anatomy. The story of our lives uh, when we started is actually of enormous importance in understanding the adult disposition of the organs. Now, I'd like to start off with presenting you with a fundamental idea. And the idea is really this. The GI tract and its three unpaired derivatives, you might regard them as you would a group of friends or a corporation or, you know, industrial corporation, but probably an intimate group of friends is more appropriate. And you can call that intimate group of friends GI tract and co. And this really consists of the GI tract and its three unpaired derivatives, the liver, the pancreas, and the spleen. 
And then you have another group of friends, uh, the UG Tract and Company, the Euro General Tract and Company, and this actually consists of the right and left Euro Genital Tract and its three associated, this time, paired kidneys, the sex glands, and the adrenals. So the GI Tract and Company and the UG Tract and Company. During early embryonic life, the three paired structures of the UG tract and company lie on each side of the aorta, covered with peritoneum of the posterior abdominal wall. And interestingly, this is the condition that prevails in the adult frog as well. And in this, at the same embryonic stage, the GI tract and company was a straight tube of uniform caliber strung from the front of the aorta by a mesentery. And this is called the primitive dorsal mesentery. So in this diagram, you would see that the UG tract and company is covered with peritoneum against the posterior abdominal wall. There's a dorsal mesentery carrying the vessels, and then you have the GI tract and company. Okay, so the GI tract and co and the UG tract and co. Now there are three separate unpaired branches of the aorta, the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric arteries supplying the GI tract and company. That is the GI tract and its three unpaired derivatives, the liver, the pancreas, and the spleen. The superior mesenteric artery is continued as the vitiline artery through the umbilicus to supply the yolk sac. Now, I'm told I have to tell you that there is in fact a little bit of a lag in the audio um, a few seconds before you can actually hear what I'm saying, but that shouldn't actually um, in any way impact upon the uh, presentation and the seminar. Now, over here, you again see the fact that there is the, uh, the GI tract and company supplied by the three vessels, the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. And this is how it looks in the primitive embryo. Uh, you have a foregut, a midgut artery, and the hindgut artery, which is the inferior mesenteric artery. Now, when you come to the veins, the portal vein is formed by three unpaired veins. The splenic vein, which actually could also be called the celiac vein because it transmits much of the blood that the celiac artery delivers to the foregut back to the liver. So the splenic vein, the superior mesenteric vein, and the inferior mesenteric vein. Um, so the portal vein returns to the liver the blood that the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric arteries conveyed to the GI tract and company. Except, of course, the liver, because it returns blood to the liver. The portal vein, therefore, receives all the blood returning from GI tract and company, and no other blood. So you have the portal vein formed by the union of the superior mesenteric, the inferior mesenteric, um, and the splenic vein. And the splenic vein, as I explained to you, could also be called the celiac vein in some ways, because that's the function it performs in the adult. Now, you have to remember the adult GI tract is more than 20 feet in length. You know that already. But the abdominal cavity is only about two feet long. So the time must come in, the, in early embryonic life when the gut ceases to be a straight tube confined to the median plane. The small bowel therefore becomes convoluted and a long loop of gut 
which is cecum and adjacent parts of small and large bowel, take part in a counterclockwise rotation around the superior mesenteric axis uh, artery as the axis of that rotation. So temporarily, the cecum is brought to, to the underside of the liver, and from here, it ultimately descends to the right lower quadrant, like this. So the superior mesenteric artery is the fulcrum or the axis, and the gut rotates around it. And this is a sort of a time sequence thing you might call of the rotation of the gut. Essentially, some parts of the gut come in front of the superior mesenteric artery, some parts of the gut go behind it, and earlier in fetal life, there is a straight tube or a very simple kind of tube, foregut, midgut, hindgut, and then on the right side, after the rotations, you see pretty much the adult pattern. The foregut, the midgut, and hindgut are all midline structures in embryonic life. And this is why a concept that I'll keep coming back to in this lecture. Uh, remember that the foregut, the midgut, the hindgut, as in the left side of this picture, were all midline structures. And they were suspended by a common mesentery, the dorsal mesentery. Now, after rotation of the foregut, midgut, and hindgut, some parts of the bowel lose their mesentery and become plastered to the posterior abdominal wall. And those parts of the gut that do so are the parts of the duodenum, most of the duodenum, in fact, the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure of the ascending colon, and the descending colon. These, so to speak, lose their mesentery and become retroperitoneal. But remember, these were all formerly midline structures. So, this is after rotation, and those shaded areas are basically what was, in fact, a freestanding mesentery in the midline at one time. And so I've kind of called it the mesentery of the ascending colon and hepatic flexure, the mesentery of the descending colon, and the mesoduodenum. Um, but essentially, these are all retroperitoneal structures in the adult, and you know now how that happens. Just as in the fact that when you're opening a book, pages two and three of an opened book must come to lie in front of pages one and four, so every part of GI tract and co must come to lie in front of everything pertaining to UG tract and co. So GI tract and co must lie in front of kidneys, adrenals, testes, ovaries, ureters, and adrenal or renal or testicular ovarian vessels. So all these structures are UG tract and co, and all GI tract and co structures must come to lie in the adult in front of UG tract and co. The rectum and the anal canal do not take part in the gut lengthening process, so they do not rotate and are able to retain their primitive midline positions. So this is uh, illustrating the book analogy that I just referred to. Uh, back of the abdomen against the body wall are UG tract, urogenital tract and co. In front of it, Always in front of it is GI tract and co. The counterclockwise rotation of the gut must necessarily bring some part of the bowel in front of the superior mesenteric axis and some part behind it. I refer to that already. Uh, so the third part of the duodenum passes behind the SMA and the transverse colon passes in front. In mobilizing the bowel, you take advantage of embryological planes of fusion and restore structures pertaining to GI tract and co to the embryological midline. In other words, what you're doing is simply giving the mobilized structure its former mesentery. 
It follows, therefore, that the steps in cauterization of the duodenum would be, first, you divide the peritoneum lateral to hepatic flexure of colon and superior to it, because, as I just explained to you, the hepatic flexure is actually on the second part of the duodenum. It has lost its mesentery there. You have to bring it down away from the duodenum. After that, you divide the peritoneum on the lateral aspect of the duodenum and close to it. You place your finger in the foramen of Winslow and break down the somewhat flimsy areolar tissue in that area. And then you develop the embryological fusion plane behind the second and third parts of the duodenum and pancreas. So this is the first stage of that mobilization. Uh, what you do essentially is you divide the peritoneum like I explained to you. You are able to then put your finger through the foramen of Winslow and then put your entire hand eventually behind the duodenum and pancreas. And you can have the pancreas and duodenum uh, between your uh, the fingers of your hand behind the duodenum and pancreas and your thumb anterior to it, and you can then examine the pancreas in that fashion. Now, this is the second stage of that mobilization. Uh, as you can see, the entire pancreas head also lifts with the duodenum because it, that also is part of that embryological plane of fusion. So if you, essentially what you're doing, as I explained to you, is you're restoring these structures to their embryological midline. Now, I'm going to introduce you to another player in this piece, and that's called the ventral mesentery or the ventral mesogastrium. So this is in addition to the primitive dorsal mesentery. So you have a dorsal mesentery and a ventral me mesentery or ventral mesogastrium. Now the ventral mesentery exists only above the umbilicus and first inch of duodenum, and the liver divides this ventral mesentery into two portions, the falciform ligament and the gastrohepatic or lesser omentum. The left umbilical vein lies in the free edge of one of these divisions of the ventral mesogastrium and the bile ducts in the free edge of the other. And just as the liver divides the ventral mesogastrium into two parts, the spleen divides the dorsal mesentery into two portions, the gastrosplenic ligament and the spleno-renal ligament. So, uh, this is how it looks in the embryo. You have the ventral mesentery anterior to the stomach in the picture. You have the dorsal mesentery posterior to the stomach in the picture. You have the liver dividing the ventral mesentery or ventral mesogastrium into a falciform ligament indicated by the number one and the lesser omentum or gastrohepatic ligament indicated by the number two. The gastrohepatic ligament has at it, on its free border the bile duct. And then you get to the dorsal mesentery behind the stomach in this picture. And here you see the spleen dividing it into two. The gastrosplenic ligament indicated by the number three and the spleno-renal ligament or leno-renal ligament indicated by the number four. Now as uh, the embryology proceeds, the embryological development proceeds, the liver enlarges rightward and relegates the stomach and spleen to the left. Now, in accordance with the fundamental principle of GI tract and company, 
in front of UG tract and company? The liver is in front of the right kidney and adrenal. The stomach and spleen are in front of the left kidney and adrenal and their accompanying vessels, of course, the renal vessels and the adrenal vessels. Now, here you have the uh, UG tract and company at the back, the GI tract and company in the front. Uh, remember, this is not illustrated in the way you would see a CAT scan, but it's the other way around. But it's pretty easy to make out the orientation because you just look at the kidneys on the aorta and that's posterior. So early on, the uh, you see how that it's still a, a midline structure, the dorsal mesentery, the stomach, and then you have the liver dividing the dividing the ventral mesentery, and then you have the, the spleen dividing the dorsal mesentery into the lenorenal ligament or the splenorenal ligament and the gastrosplenic ligament. And later on, the stomach and spleen are pushed to the left and the liver is pushed to the right. And that's how the adult relationships take place. So the primitive splenorenal ligament and dorsal mesentery, which is continuous with the aorta, and carries the splenic artery and vein and pancreas with it, moves further left and it's forced against the posterior abdominal wall and becomes retroperitoneal, including, of course, the pancreas, which is which develops in the dorsal mesentery. The de development of the pancreas is something we can talk about in another lecture. The adult spleno-renal ligament, therefore, may be sharply divided. Of course, in trauma, what happens is there's already blood in that area, and it, it, and it does the dissection for you. In other words, it does that dissection I was talking to you about where the surgeon makes advantage of that embryological plane. And you usually can just break through that area with your finger, and you don't actually have to sharply divide it as you would do in an elective splenectomy. So you divide the splenorenal ligament, lateral to the spleen, you can, with your left hand, if you're right-handed, you can uh, hold the spleen, move it forward and medially toward the wound, and with a long scissor, you can sharply divide that spleen or renal ligament, knowing that there is, in fact, nothing except the kidney, of course, that is below that. So divide the spleen or renal ligament lateral to the spleen, and the entire primitive dorsal mesentery carrying the splenic vessels and the pancreas may be restored. And again, I'm coming to a basic principle, a basic concept. You're restoring them to their embryological midline. And because of your knowledge of surgical anatomy and embryology, you can bring, in this fashion, a deeply placed posterior structure, the spleen, out of its hiding place, so to speak, and right up to your laparotomy incision. You are restoring it, just as you did with the duodenum on the right side, you're restoring the spleen to its embryological midline. Now, I'm not going to, going to go into the surgical technique of splenectomy and um, the things you can do with cauterization of the duodenum and so on, uh, because this is a surgical anatomy seminar lecture. So, in this um, picture, you can see how there is a gastrosplenic ligament, and then the spleno-renal ligament, the spleen there, and then essentially it's asking you to divide the spleno-renal spleno -renal ligament in order to get into that embryological plane of fusion. Once you do that, you can lift the spleen clean out of the posterior abdomen and towards your laparotomy incision, as I explained to you. That is the plane. And essentially, again, you're restoring the structure to its embryological midline. Now, in practice, it looks like this. 
uh, you can see how <coughs> the pancreas also comes up with the spleen again because it's it was part of that dorsal mesentery it develops in the dorsal mesentery and again you see very clearly here how in fact GI tract and company of which the spleen is part is anterior anterior to UG tract and company of which the kidney is part so UG tract and co in front uh, GI tract and co I beg your pardon in front always of UG tract and co so what I've been trying to convey to you or hopefully get you excited about is that you can actually think of anatomy and surgical anatomy not in a dry fashion but in a in a deductive fashion now don't ask me you know exactly why that rotation takes place and all that um, I mean uh, this in the Psalms the psalmist says we are fearfully and wonderfully made and I don't understand exactly how those wonderful rotations take place but I know what happens and I know that because those things happen you get those adult relationships and uh, some of you may know these embryological details already but when you know the embryology you can deduce a lot of the adult anatomy similarly if you know function you can deduce structure and vice versa so I want to leave you with some more takeaways of anatomical fact deductive surgical anatomy based on what I've told you uh, because the UG tract and company started and remained retroperitoneal in the embryo they remain so in the adult because the GI tract and company started and remained in front of UG tract and company these relationships these relationships are maintained in the adult even in retroperitoneal parts of GI tract and company so you may you may know of course that the duodenum is retroperitoneal so is the kidney however the duodenum was part of GI tract and co so it has to be in front of UG tract and co which is the kidney uh, similarly the uh, let's say the ascending colon uh, when you mobilize it in a right hemicolectomy you're looking for the structures of urogenital tract and co UG tract and co behind the colon and the primitive mesentery that you've mo mobilized into the midline and you'll find that the ureter the testicular vessels ovarian vessels are in fact behind GI tract and co so because GI tract and co started and remained in front of UG tract and co these relationships are maintained in the adult even in retroperitoneal parts of the GI tract and co now since the GI tract and co started embryological life as midline structures the surgeon can restore lateral GI tract and co structures to the embryological midline both on the right side and on the left spleen as I've showed you the descending colon the ascending colon the duodenum and the pancreas now many of the ideas of deductive anatomy um, being excited with the idea of anatomy uh, came to me quite early in my career as a medical student and uh, and resident registrar through examining the many works of uh, what I who I consider the greatest anatomist of the 20th century uh, JC Grant some of you might already have his atlas uh, if you don't uh, I, I have no shares in the company that now prints the atlas but I would highly recommend that you go and buy one of these atlases the Grant's Atlas of Anatomy which is I think the surgeon's atlas compared to Netter's which is probably a medical student's atlas um, JC Grant 
immigrated to Canada from Scotland, uh, started his career in Winnipeg, then moved to Toronto and established there probably the preeminent Department of Anatomy in the world at the time. There's a grand uh, museum, I believe, of anatomy still in, in the Toronto Department of Anatomy. And they are, of course, rightly very proud of uh, the fact that J.C. Grant was, uh, in fact, a professor of anatomy in Toronto for many, many years. Now, J.C. Grant also published another book, which is now out of print. It's available on Amazon in various places through uh, secondhand bookstores. Uh, if you're interested, and I would highly recommend it, get his book called The Method of Anatomy. Some of the line diagrams I showed you are taken from Method of Anatomy. So the Atlas of Anatomy is his other great work, uh, which was a seminal work at that time for an Atlas of Anatomy in English. And then you have the uh, other great book, which is unfortunately now out of print. It's called The Method of Anatomy. And uh, I'm going to end this lecture by quoting from the Method of Anatomy's preface, quote, J.C. Grant says, the student must learn to reason anatomically. The bare, dry, and unrelated facts of anatomy tend to disappear into forgetfulness. That is largely because its guiding principles are not grasped so as to capture the imagination. Once they are grasped, it will be found that details and relationships will remain within easy and certain recall. Now, that was my first YouTube live broadcast to you guys. I was told by Cornelius, my son, that you guys must be uh, more than very familiar with this medium because uh, all of you are gamers and so on. So I do want to ask your apologies if I've not been slick enough uh, from a technological point of view. Um, I am planning to do at least one of these every week, and I'll let you know in advance. And thank you for being a very receptive audience of, I believe, 17 viewers. Um, if there's anything that you want to ask in the seminars, you can either ask me uh, through the live chat uh, on the right of the screen. Um, your screen, that is. Or you can send me an email or something afterwards. Thank you very much. Take care. Uh, God bless and be well.